And happy Friday to you. Bob Schieffer here, and we're talking about what happens now first in Massachusetts. Who's going to fill the uh, Kennedy uh, shoes? Then we're going to talk to Dan Boltz, who has a new book about uh, Campaign 08 and some real inside stories on that front. But to start, Jennifer Palmieri, who is a Democratic strategist, has worked in a lot of Democratic campaigns, is here with us. Doug High is a uh, Republican strategist. And I want to ask both of you what's going on up in Massachusetts, because we had this very unusual law there. The governor can't appoint somebody uh, to uh, fill that seat. Uh, they have to wait something like 140-something days, maybe it'd be January, before they could appoint somebody. And we should point out in the beginning, Jennifer, this didn't used to be the case. Uh, it was the case after uh, John Kerry decided to run for the presidency, and they right. wanted to make sure Mitt Romney couldn't appoint a Republican right. to fill that seat. So that's when this law went into effect. Doug, now they're talking about uh, changing the law, and you know, with the big majorities they have up there in the Massachusetts legislature, my guess is that's practically a done deal. It, it absolutely is a done deal. There's there's no way the Democrats uh, in Massachusetts. If you look at their congressional delegation, 100% Democratic. Uh, there's, there's no way they're not going to change this law and probably change it pretty quickly. Uh, the, the fact that they changed the law to not allow Mitt Romney uh, the power to, to appoint if uh, John Kerry had won uh, and now want to do a total 180 on this really speaks to why Americans are cyn cynical about pol politics and politicians. Uh, but that, you know, that aside, they'll get this done very quickly uh, as soon as they have time to. Well, Jennifer, do you think this is a cynical act? Well, I think that it's a little bit embarrassing for the uh, for the Democrats in in, in Massachusetts. But um, the the man who coined the phrase "all politics is local," <laughs> being from Boston, it also has a pretty short horizon, I think, in Boston. So I think that it's it's a little bit uncomfortable for them that they have to undo what they did in 2004. I know it was unpopular, certainly, with uh, you know editorial boards and whatnot in 2004 when they uh, when they made this change to protect uh, John Kerry's seat. But I think that um, you know this is what the Democrats, I th this is what Massachusetts voters probably want. There's there is really important stuff happening in Congress. Massachusetts probably should be represented so I think they'll do it although there's a lot of politics even within the Massachusetts state legislature and I know that the Democrats there are concerned about retribution from Republicans and other things they want to do so it's a little messy but I think it'll get but done. The, the significance on the national scale of course is is the Democrats in the Senate want to have that vote they mm -hmm. need that vote now yeah. uh, because you've got health care coming up and uh, with uh, Senator Byrd uh, you know very ill at this time uh, they really only have 58 Democrats, uh, uh, rather than the 60 that they were, you know, the, which would be the veto-proof yeah. uh, Senate. But uh, why shouldn't they do this, uh, Doug? Well, I, I mean, think I think they should. Uh, you, uh, just for for the reason you point out, uh, there's a Senate seat short. Uh, we've got a lot of issues, not just health care, but a lot of issues that are facing the country that are dramatically important. Uh, and it, it's important to have that seat filled just as, as quickly as possible. Of course, there's, there will be a time, there's always a time period uh, between somebody being replaced. We just saw today with uh, uh, Governor Christ making the appointment in Florida. Uh, it's not a, a turnkey tra immediate transition. Uh, but it, it still is an issue that, uh, as Jennifer points out, is embarrassing for them. But the reality is, once it's done, that will stop being embarrassing, you know, by yeah. day two or three. And it's interesting. I, I don't, I haven't seen, at least yet, I don't think any Republicans in the Senate or at the national level expressing concern about this. I mean, because Harry Reid is definitely going to need every vote that he can get. So I could see uh, the Republicans in the United States Senate uh, raising objections to this, but you haven't seen that, which I guess just speaks to people wanting to. Well, uh, and and you also don't want to appear to be political uh, right, at this time when it comes down to Ted Kennedy. And they all love him, Senator Absolutely. Kennedy so much. Yeah. There, there uh, uh, is a lot of talk, and I'm not sure how serious li seriously I take it, that uh, Senator Kennedy's death will somehow change the debate and the tone of the debate, that uh, there will be let's do this for Teddy kind of uh, spirit in the, in the Senate. Uh, do you think that's going to happen, Doug? I think Democrats have to be very careful about how they do this. I, I talked to a friend in Boston yesterday uh, who said that he was watching uh, the organizing for the health care rally and then said, er, I mean Kennedy procession. 
uh, we go back to uh, to Paul Wellstone's funeral. Uh, really mm -hmm. backfired on Democrats. I was reading uh, Daily Kos yesterday. Uh, talked about passing health care reform, immigration, and uh, a third issue that I, that I forget at this time. But they, they referred to it as the Teddy trifecta. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be very careful about how yeah. you proceed because if this is then uh, uh, win one for you know, we we say in Republicans win one for the Gipper. If they go we overboard, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> if they go overboard with trying to do this for Ted Kennedy, mm -hmm. uh, it, it really can backfire and can change the debate in a, in a way they really don't want. It well, but of course, Lyndon Johnson uh, talked about let's do it for for John Kennedy mm -hmm. when he got some monumental civil rights bills passed. That was not the only thing that caused it to pass, but mm -hmm. yeah. it certainly was part right. of it. Um, I think it's telling that the president and what he has said has not brought that, he has not brought health care up. He hasn't said, and now we need to move forward in this. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, uh, that's probably a smart thing to do in his, but I think that, um, the sides are so dug in and not necessarily in a cynical way. I think people feel really strongly on both sides of this issue that it's just, I think that his passing isn't going to be enough to, to yeah. pull people. And certainly if it is going to affect people, it's not going to affect people because you were told to do that. It's mm -hmm. going to be a, a personal thing. But, you know, Politico I mean, had an article today, I'm sorry, um, that uh, said that this, that this whole debate may change how blue dogs and moderate Democrats vote mm -hmm. on this. But I, I think it's really difficult to see what blue dogs are identified because it certainly won't change how their constituents feel about it. Now, I'm from North Carolina and I look at uh, a freshman member, Larry Kissel, who uh, narrowly won his, uh, his election. Uh, his voters are not going to be swayed on this uh, because of yeah. uh, Ted Kennedy's passing. All right, well, we have to, we have to leave it there. Thanks to both of pleasure. you for Thank some you very interesting points. I think the bottom line here uh, for our viewers is that uh, in short order, uh, the law is going to be changed in Massachusetts, and somebody is going to be appointed to fill out. And, and to what you said earlier, they'll, they'll fill the seat, but you're never going to fill his shoes. Yeah. Thanks to both of you. Thank you. On another uh, note, I want to talk now with uh, my old friend Dan Boltz, Boltz who is uh, the chief uh, political editor over at uh, the Washington Post. And he and uh, Haynes Johnson, a uh, longtime Post reporter and, uh, and an author of many books, have just written a new book called The Battle for America. 2008. It is a wonderful book. It's, uh, it's an account of uh, what I think is one of the most interesting campaigns, uh, certainly in all the campaigns that I've covered. Uh, Dan, uh, welcome. And I must say, this was quite a job, wasn't it? Because I remember when all those Teddy Kennedy, uh, Teddy uh, White books came out, <laughs> uh, we got this great behind the scenes view of what was going on in politics. But now there's so much coverage. There's almost not very much going on behind the scenes. It's all out in front of the scenes. How in the world were you able to put together this book and come up? Because there are some things in here that uh, I'll tell you for sure I didn't know. But it, it's it's a hard job these days, isn't it? Well, there's no question about that, Bob. And and, and thank you. Um, it uh, you know these campaigns are covered at, at such a level of minutia. Um, our goal actually starting out was not to think of this book as totally an inside book. I mean, we wanted to try to elevate it. Uh, we felt that this was going to be a very important campaign for the country. The country was certainly at a turning point when the campaign began after the unpopularity of the wars in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan and the, an economy beginning to weaken, though it got much worse throughout the campaign. Uh, Haynes's sense and my sense both were that this was a campaign worthy of a book. Um, we obviously had no idea when we got into it just how interesting and, and uh, dramatic the campaign would turn out to be. Um, and, but in any campaign, there are things that you can pry out once once events have moved on. And we were able to do that, and I think we were able to pull together uh, both in uh, interviews that we did, including a really revealing interview with uh, President-elect Obama in 2008 in December, uh, six weeks after his election, but also with the top advisors for all the campaigns. So uh, we think there's a lot of fresh material. We like to think that we've been able to create a sense of suspense uh, on a story in which most people uh, generally do know the whole story and particularly how it ends. You got some very interesting stuff uh, on the other side, on the Republican side, too. I thought especially about uh, uh, Sarah Palin. Uh, when you finally came down to it, why do you think that uh, John McCain uh, decided to pick Sarah Palin? Bob, I think there are three reasons that he made that decision. The first, uh, and I think the most uh, obvious, is 
At the time they had to make a selection, they were convinced they were going to lose the election unless they did something dramatic to shake it up. They needed to, in one way or another, change the trajectory uh, of an election that was heading towards Barack Obama and the Democrats just because the country was unhappy. It was in a mood for change. It was tired of the Bush presidency. Uh, it had already voted the Republicans out of power in Congress. So that was one reason. They just feared they were going to lose if they didn't do something dramatic. Second reason was they were, they were not doing well with women. John McCain was not getting enough of the women's vote for them to feel they had a chance of winning. Their hope was that if they picked a woman, uh, that uh, that might help them reach out to disaffected female voters who had supported Hillary Clinton and were not that uh, um, likely to vote for uh, Barack Obama. I think that was a strategic miscalculation, frankly, but I think that went into it. And third, I think McCain saw in Sarah Palin somebody who he believed was like himself, which is to say somebody who was a reformer at heart. And I think he wanted to be able to run as somebody who would go and shake up Washington. She had defeated an incumbent governor of her own party when she was elected governor. And I think McCain thought that she would be a fellow uh, reformer and that they could sell the ticket in a way that Americans had not looked at him uh, through most of the campaign. And now, uh, this part is not in your book, of course, but now we have this situation where Sarah Palin is just the latest in a number of politicians who have left office before their term was up. This is kind of a new trend, it seems to me. Why, 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 why do you think that's happening? It, it, it is a new trend. It's, it's, it's not a good trend, frankly. I mean, I think when people sign on to be, you know, governors or senators or whatever, uh, that they have an obligation to fill that term unless there are truly extraordinary circumstances. But the idea of kind of walking away from the job, I thought Sarah Palin's uh, uh, explanation for it, which is that she was trying to uh, spare Alaska from lame duck politics, was in many ways a kind of a lame rationale for doing it. But we're seeing it more and more. It's almost as if these jobs become awfully tedious, and I can understand that, you know, in, a, in the environment, the pol polarized environment we're in, in the media environment we're in, that, uh, that it can be difficult to do it. But I don't think it's a healthy trend. Well, I mean, to just today, Governor Chris down in Florida is appointing a replacement for Mel Martinez, a senator who right. uh, down there decided not to finish out his term. Uh, former House Speaker Denny Hastert decided he would leave before it was all over. It's almost uh, like, uh, well, uh, I don't have much future here, so why should I keep on with it? And I, I, I have to say that I agree with you. I think it is not uh, a very healthy trend. What do you think, uh, getting back to your book, Dan, in the end uh, was the reason that Barack Obama was able to defeat Hillary Clinton? Because we had these two very different uh, ideas about how you get the nomination, two very well funded candidates, two uh, very well known candidates. But in the end, it seems to me, he just ran a better campaign than she did. Why, why do you think, why do you think that was? Well, Bob, you're, you're absolutely right. He did run a better campaign. Uh, I would say this, that the first big reason was her vote uh, for the Iraq war resolution. Um, I think that that was something that opened up the uh, liberal activist wing of the party to Senator Obama when he was running, and it was a big, big factor in it. I think the second is that um, at critical points in the campaign, her operation foundered and his operation soared. Uh, they understood how to uh, maneuver through the caucuses far more effectively than she did. They understood the calendar. They understood the, the delegate selection process. All things you would have thought that the mighty Clinton network and machine would have known uh, how to do better than, than Obama. And third, I think that Obama, which is the key of all good and successful candidates, frankly, uh, understood the mood of the country and was able to speak to it more effectively than she was. She was, uh, she had a lot of attributes and in the end, Bob, as you know, she turned into a very, very strong candidate. Um, but, uh, but I think that Obama, through the course of that campaign, was able to seize the mood and, and uh, identify it and speak to it more effectively than she. I think you're exactly right. It is the candidate always who seizes the mood, who catches the mood of the country at exactly that moment, uh, who, who winds up winning. And in this case, we saw it was Barack Obama. 
Uh, Dan, uh, really enjoyed your book. Uh, hope you sell a bunch of them. Thanks for being with us this Thanks morning. so much. Thanks, Bob. And finally today, uh, unless you just got back from Mars, you know that President Obama is on vacation this week. The presidency is the best job in the world, but if ever there was a job that's hard to get away from, certainly the presidency is that job. And that is why planning a presidential vacation is so delicate. Bill Clinton was so worried about the political fallout from vacationing that his people actually ran polls to see where the public thought he ought to take time off. When Gerald Ford went to Vail, uh, Colorado at Christmas time, his aides always stressed that it was a, quote, working vacation. One of the reasons I always liked Gerald Ford was that when I asked him one day if he'd come out to Colorado to work, he said, well, no, I came out here to ski. Ford didn't worry all that much about things like that as much as some White House folks did, but the truth is presidential vacations can be a risky undertaking. Just ask George Bush. He was back there kicking up his heels in Texas at his ranch when along came Hurricane Katrina. His administration was never the same after the slow response to that disaster. Americans didn't like it when his dad held news conferences at the golf course while soldiers were preparing for war in Iraq. And during the presidential campaign in 2004, Republicans loved to call attention to those pictures of John Kerry windsurfing. They thought it made him look elitist. So perhaps President Obama does not really deserve some profile and courage award for saying the purpose of his vacation is to relax, but I'm glad he's being candid about it. Even so, he should be very careful and not go too far. I'd hold off on windsurfing for sure, probably croquet, and for heaven's sakes, don't get caught wearing those slacks with little whales on them. You might be accused of being an elitist. That's it for Washington Unplugged. Don't forget to watch us, uh, watch us on television on Sunday when we'll talk to John McCain and Orrin Hatch and Dianne Feinstein and a lot of Senator Kennedy's friends. See you then.